And I'm going to pass straight over to Andy, who's going to continue, but in a practical sense, the, the things he talked about last year. And he's going to do it without a PowerPoint, <laughs> without a computer. Well, actually, a VNA. So <laughs> over to you. OK, hello, everyone. Yeah, so I think, um, as Chris said, last year, it was probably a bit heavy on the theory. And we, it, it ran on a bit, so I think we uh, never got round to some of the more practical aspects. So uh, actually, I think I can't really do, do it with glasses. So, um, but maybe some of you didn't attend last year, so very quickly. The, the object of the exercise is to try and get you to think Smith charts. Uh, and I think often um, people shy away from Smith charts because they just think, I can't understand that. I'm not even going to try. And uh, my mission was to try and get you thinking that way because it greatly simplifies thinking about matching networks. Um, and perhaps you don't often these days get to make your own matching networks um, because you buy a off-the-shelf beam or something like that. But um, probably the areas that you might get into thinking about matching networks is an 80-meter vertical or a 160-meter vertical. Um, and that's what I'll focus on as the, the example. I'm only going to do one example because we haven't really got enough time. It might take five minutes <laughs> or, or it might take a lot longer. We'll see. But uh, starting with a, just a brief reminder, um, Smith chart. So Smith chart is circular. We have an axis through the middle and this is zero ohms, so it's a short circuit, and this is infinity ohms, so that's uh, an open circuit along this axis here. So this is purely resistive. Um, then you might familiarly see this circle here. This is quite often called the unit circle, um, but that's because the Smith chart can be normalized to any p impedance. And what we mean by normalizing is that the middle has been set to some value which for most of us will be 50 ohms. Um, Tony mentioned earlier about normalizing to 75 ohms for measuring um, that 75 ohm um, high Z um, preamp. But normally that would be 50 ohms, but sometimes we think about this as being one. So it's the normal, normalized center of the, the Smith chart. And that is where we want to get to, because that is, where, is, is a 50 ohm match. Um, <coughs> And then you'll see also reticules like this. Now, what this means is that, so this, this upper half here, this is an inductor. And down here, it's all, it's all capacitive. So this half is capacitive, so draw a little capacitor. So just remember that this half's inductive, this half is capacitive. And if we were at 50 ohms, we had a 50 ohm resistor. So we have a 50 ohm resistor. And we add some reactance to it. And let's say we add some inductance to it. If we look in there, actually, as we increase the inductive reactance, we travel in that direction. So the, the, this graphical here is, is, re, is registering the increasing um, reactive part. So resistive part, inductive reactance, capacitive reactance. Okay, so that's just a reminder. Um, <clears throat> VNA, you can see on the screen, um, this one came from Martin Lynch actually. Um, this is a slightly bigger screen version, so it's a little bit more expensive. Um, <clears throat> you can see on there, in fact, I will, as a stylus comes with it, and you can just tap the screen and you get a menu come up. <coughs> Doesn't show very well on that, but anyway. If I change the, uh, I can turn off, I'll turn it, because it has, generally has two graticals in, in uh, you can have the Smith chart and you can also have like um, the rectangular plot because it was displaying S21 and S11. S11 is measuring impedance. So there's, there's a, this port here, 
you can see that it's labelled S11. If you were measuring um, a through measurement, so like loss or something like that, that's an S21 measurement, so you'd connect something between these two ports here. But I'm going to focus on measuring <coughs> impedances, and so all we need for this is the S11 port. And the display, as we see here, I've set to be a Smith chart, and it's hopefully similar to this. So the first thing you need to do is to calibrate. So if I go to the calibration menu, I've at, so I've got this particular one <coughs> set to a span of, well, from 3 to 4 megahertz. I don't know if you can see that down there, but um, that says 3, and that says 4. Um, <coughs> and the reason I'm using that range is you want to use as narrow as possible, actually. You, know, you don't want it covering a huge frequency range that you're not interested in. Just use the range that you're interested in. And I've chosen to do this demo at 80 meters because with my tuner unit here, which has got some quite long lead lengths, I don't want those long lead lengths to sort of muddy the waters of <laughs> with the extra inductance that's included in those cables. So 80 meters is a good choice for, for, for a demo. And, it, and in fact, it's probably you know quite representative of, of your 80 meter antenna, your 160 meter antenna. So that's what I've chosen. Um, and then calibrate. You need to do a calibration to make sure that um, it's accurate. So I'd go through a calibration process with you. So what we're going to do is we're going to calibrate for an open, a short, and a load. So if I connect my piece of coax, and what I'm going to be doing is connecting this piece of coax so we'll be calibrating to the end of the coax. And that could be a very long piece of coax. So the other thing that you get by doing the calibration is you can just connect any arbitrary length of cable. And it will be correct at the end of the cable that you've calibrated to. So let's just connect this cable up. I think I need that through connector. And in this kit, you get given the calibration standards. So we want to use an open. Actually, you can tell the difference between an, an open and a short just by looking in at them, because one of them has got a piece of um, metal straight across the end of it, and the other, you can see, is doesn't. So um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you could do that. So this is an open. And then what I do is click open. It's doing its calibration. Sure. So this is going to be short. On the calibration menu here, it says short. So all you do is click on short. Off it does, goes and does, and it actually gives you a little tick next to each item that you've when you've completed it. <clears throat> and finally, the load, the 50 ohm load in this case. So, come load. Okay. Um, when you've finished, you need to tell, you, tell it you've finished. So you click on the done. And then you need to save it in one of the save, save registers. And I'll go back to putting it into the 3 to 4 megahertz that I already set up before the, the, the frequency range. And that's it. Right, so first thing to do is, was the calibration successful? So I think you should better see there that actually it's in the middle on the 50 ohm one, but is it right at the edges? So let's put in the other two and just check. So 
Don't know what this is. I guess we'll find out. Right, so that's now right over on the other side. So that's at the open circuit end. And it was indeed the open circuit I connected up. And we do the same thing finally with the short. There it is over there. So all frequencies in that range for the short circuit are over in that side of the Smith chart. Now, so what that that means is that we've we've kind of anchored three positions on the Smith chart. So the accuracy um, of this instrument is going to, now is going to be very good in these areas. And obviously, we particularly want that to be accurate around 50 ohms. But sort of be aware that. There's some maths that goes on in trying to figure out where to place all of the data to make it anchor in these three places. But those are the only three places that it's really accurate. And it's going to be re have reduced accuracy the further you move away from any of those. So particularly around here and around here, it will be less accurate. And it's why you may see um, a transmission line even sort of curve inwards around here, because, or, or even go beyond the Smith chart, which can't be possible in a passive network. Um, and that's due to the inaccuracy of, of, of the calibration. OK, so um, right. So I'm, I'm going to, I've got a load here, which is representative of an 80 meter, a short 80 meter vertical. Um, so, and we're going to connect this up. That one. Keep my crib notes. So, what I've actually put on there is is twenty two ohms in series with three hundred and thirty peak farads. Um, which is actually sort of representative of something which might be like a 30 foot vertical or something like that on 80 meters um, ish, you know. And the reactance of that 138 ohms of capacitive reactance. So you, another way you might you might um, describe that is 22 minus J. 138 ohms, and the minus the minus bit means it's capacitive, and the J is to do with complex numbers, but we won't worry about that. You might see that talked about. So it will all be minus J down here and plus J up there. <coughs> okay, so what have we actually got? You can see on the screen there that um, well, it's come out at. 22.6 minus 153J. So it's, it's quite accurate on that one, less accurate on that one, but maybe that's the tolerance of the capacitor I used. Um, but as I've said to you before anyway, we're operating, the, that's showing something around here. So the accuracy is going to be poorer as you get closer to the edge. Um, which incidentally is why um, often you measure stuff, create a matching network that you've calculated with some calculator somewhere, and then find it doesn't quite get you to 50 ohms because your original estimate was wrong. So what I'm going to show you is how we might match um, that, that impedance. Now the, the other thing I'm going to show you on here is another circle in this half. So 
what that is, is the unit circle for the admittance chart. So the black was in, and the impedance chart, and what I mean by that is that everything is in series. So all the components are in series, so it's a, seri a series R and C or L. But the admittance chart, they're in parallel with one another. Um, so, for instance, the Smith chart can be used. So, I think I mentioned last year that, um, yeah, okay. So, a resistor in series with a capacitor, for example, is equivalent to a different resistor in, in parallel with a slightly different capacitor. <coughs> and if the reactance of that is um, is large enough, then you'll find that that gets bigger. Um, and the way you could have figured that out from the Smith chart, so we're, we're kind of round here somewhere, is that because, um, so we, we, we have in the, on the impedance chart, we have, if you, if you sort of like follow the lines of the graticule for the Smith chart round to the resistive part, you find that comes out at our 22 ohms. And the outside edge, the, this graticule out here, so this coming out to here, that, that position there is going to be our minus what, 138 ohms. If you, f it, the admittance chart is basically just the, the impedance chart flipped. So, you know, if I drew lines on this, for the you'd get these going out here. So, what that means is that so you've got some circles in this direction. All you would have to do is follow the, that line up here for the admittance chart. And that value there would actually come out at um, the, the, the equivalent parallel impedance. And I can't, I think I wrote that down somewhere. Yeah, it should come out at 888 ohms. So that would come out at sort of 888 ohms. So that's one way of doing your series to parallel conversion without having to use a calculator at all. And people used to do that all the time um, before calculators came along. <laughs> so. Um, so th this shows you how you can think of an impedance as being two different things, really, and that's the principle of matching that works. So the the reason I drew that circle there um, was because if we use just two two components to get to 50 ohms to get to this point here, the first component needs to get us either on this circle or on this circle. And once we get onto either of those circles, we know that we can get back to the middle, either through this route or through this route. And I'm going to demonstrate that on the, on this Smith chart using the tuner. And hopefully it will become a bit clearer. <laughs> So I even got the Goddard silver polish out just for you for the roller coaster. <laughs> it had previously been sitting in the gardens <laughs> for about a year. <laughs> First of all, but I added all these crop clips so I could demonstrate some different matching networks. Um, So let's just move this over here. Okay, so first of all, I'm just going to use a straight piece of wire 
to connect these two um, connectors together. Just to show you the effect of the wire, really. Come on, work. Don't tell me it's not going to work. I think this wire's a bit dodgy, actually. Okay, I'll have to hold on to that. Um, you probably, it's difficult to see, but actually what's happened is that it's moved slightly round that circle, and that's due to the length of this piece of wire. So it's moving up towards the inductive half, if you follow that circle round, um, just purely because I've got a little bit of wire in the way. Not by much, though, but that's just to sort of show you that. Now, what I'm going to do is connect in the roller coaster. And... Okay, so... I should actually as well. I'm just going to move the um, the marker to three and a half megs, which I forgot to do. So there's some buttons on the side that allow you to move that marker around. Okay, so that's three and a half megahertz. Right. I think I'm getting some demo effect here. There we go. Yeah, and there's a dodgy lead here somewhere. Okay. That's sort of back back to where it was anyway. Is it gonna stay no, it's not gonna stay there. Right, anyway, what I'm going to do is follow this route round here and then get onto this circle. So we have to come all the way, we have to add series inductance until we get onto the unit circle, unit admittance circle. So, <laughs> using a bit of finger, finger of persuasion, if I start increasing the inductance, I think you can see that's moving round. There we go. Now I have to guess where the unit circle is on that Smith chart display. There are some versions of um, VNA software that will allow you to put the admittance chart on as well. In that case, it'll make it a lot easier for you to get on the unit circle. But if I guess, around about there, say. OK, so now I've added my series inductance and in another component. Now, I know because it's the admittance chart that I've got to move on, that it's a parallel component I need to add next. And that has to be a capacitor because the capac so capacitive reactants will bring us back down towards this direction. So we went inductive up into the inductive half. Now we need to be less inductive. So we add parallel capacitance. That's going to bring us round here to the 50 ohms. Um, <clears throat> so if I connect up the parallel capacitor, and I think I've got it on minimum capacitance at the moment, and I'm going to have to pull that <laughs> cable again. Right, so if I, as I increase the capacitor value, you can see that moving towards the middle, following that unit admittance curve. 
Right, now, how far have I got? That... That is um, not quite far enough, so that's maximum capacitance. That's a 500 picofarad capacitor. It's actually a PAL star capacitor, but... Um, and this illustrates actually one of the problems with this particular matching network on this frequency for the for the load that I chose, and that it's quite difficult to... It needs a lot of capacitance for this particular type of matching network. So I've put a little 680 puff capacitor in parallel here, which I've got a switch on. If I turn that switch on, that will take us further round, so I've got a bit more range. So I'll adjust backwards. And there we are. And actually, if I can still hold that at the same time, if I was to change to S the, the SWR, so if I do a display format uh, SWR, there you go. So that verifies that... <laughs> Okay, but this is not the only way of doing it. Um, so ignore that because I'm not putting my hand on it. Um, there are a variety of ways you could have got to the same point. Um, so we came round here and down here, so we did. Series L, parallel C. So we've done series L, parallel C. But there, is, there are other ways you can do that. So I mentioned we could follow the, the admittance curve first. So that means you put a parallel component in first. In which case, to get to here, we'd want to instead go onto this circle and follow that circle around here. So that one would be parallel L, series C. So instead, we have parallel series C. And I'm going to demo that, actually. So... Uh, we have to do parallel... In fact, if I um, this was the reason why I brought the short, which doesn't seem to be much of a short. Let's see if it works. Just so that you can see the effect of the parallel L. Okay. Right, I think it's that cable that doesn't like it for some reason. Um, so, now, because we're adding in parallel, a parallel inductor, and at the moment I haven't got the capacitor in line, that's shorted out, that would need to be a very large inductor for, you, for it to have no effect. But the, because I left the roller inductor where it was, it's adding some, some inductive reactants. To that. So if, if, if I increase the inductance, you can see it going back to the position that it originally was at. But what we want to do is you know, make that smaller so that we approach a short circuit because as, this, as, you, as you reduce the inductance, it goes all the way around there down to a short circuit because obviously when that's, you know, no turns, just a short, you would have come back to a short circuit. So we want to get on that unit circle. And actually, it's a lot less inductance. So it's probably going to be less loss. Right. 
right, about there. So now I need to add some series C. start with okay and I'm going to turn off my switch that added the extra capacitance and let's just make sure that's working so if I start at maximum capacitance that's kind of a bit like a short circuit if there's a lot of capacitance it's like a short circuit but it's moved around a little bit because it obviously has some capacitance. So if I turn that extra capacitance that I've got, padding capacitance I've got, that'll go back closer to where it was when I just had a short going across. But actually that will end up being too much as you'll see. So I've turned off that padding capacitance and I'm reducing the capacitance and round it comes round that unit circle, gone past it. And you can see I can get, you can do a bit of fiddling and you're kind of there. A bit more, yeah, okay. So what's interesting about that is I can do that with, that looks like about 200 puff capacitance, whereas before 500 wasn't enough for the other matching network. So your choice of matching network affects the values then that might there might be some practical implications to that so i think it's probably one of the reasons why t networks uh, are more populated popular these days um but this tends to have a low pass char characteristic and this tends to have a high pass characteristic in the days of 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 valves <laughs> i think people favor didn't favor this because of harmonic problems um but that, again, that's not the only way you could have done that match. So, uh, let's pick a different colour. You might have noticed that if all we needed to do was get on one of these circles, or either that circle or that circle, what we could have done is come up here, and we're already, we're already there. We're already on that circle at that point. So why not come round here? That should be on that line. I'm just sh showing artistic license. <laughs> and then come round here. And actually, you can. Um, and what that effectively means is series C, sorry, series L, parallel L. So what we have there is... Um, Series L parallel L. Now, if I were to redraw this a little bit, so that's ground there, if my antenna is like that, my vertical, and I have an inductor to ground, if I just tap into that inductor, that is identical to that series L parallel L. So intuitively, that works and that's because th the antenna is capacitive so you've you've got um, like a tuned circuit here really the capacitance creates a tuned circuit across here and then we're just tapping down that that tuned circuit um, probably less obvious is that we could have gone up here around here <laughs> Um, and what, what does that mean? That, that, that means par parallel L and then series L, parallel series. And that's probably a little bit less obvious that, that it works, but it, it does work. Um, um, well, the 
it's difficult to tell really because I'm not sure what value of uh, inductances they come out at. Um, but they're probably the same, actually. Um, in, in general, you're trying to sort of minimize the queue of this matching network, which is one, one reason why you should only use two elements if you can. So, for instance, tuning units that have three components in them are there to try and cover all combinations. Um, but really, you want to try and only use two elements because the further, when you travel on the Smith chart, the further you move out to the outer edges, the bigger the ratio between, um, well, yeah, the, sort of the, the X over R, sort of the Q of the, of the network becomes higher. So, which you want to try and avoid because more Q generally means more loss, a, a higher Q working network means more loss. So as opposed to the individual components having a queue, what we're talking about is the queue associated with doing the match. Um, I mean, you always want the highest queue components possible, um, but your inductor will have some queue and the consequence of that queue becomes worse w when you deliberately move out towards the outer edges of the Smith chart with a multi-element matching network. So the way of, for instance, like a Pi network will move you out before you come back in again. So for example, a Pi network, um, where you have two capacitors. So parallel capacitance is going to take you in this direction. So you'll come away from well, you'll come away from wherever you're going, but you'll go away before you then add inductance and then come back with parallel capacitance again. So, which is why, I mean, for instance, you can represent a quarter wave transmission line with a pi network, and that makes you go round here, up here, and back round again. Now, obviously, you're still in 50 ohms at the beginning and at the end, but you've as part of uh, as part of going through this process, you've gone further out from the middle, so th so you see the you, the queue of this this inductor, and the further you move out, i.e. the bigger um, the the bigger these capacitors are, the more you move to the edge of the Smith chart before you come back in again. So, which you want to try and avoid. That's how you end up with mat with antenna tuners being very lossy in some combinations. I don't know if that helped. <laughs> um, I think you much, I think. Yeah. I mean, that was one of the nice things about that, for instance, is you've also got a DC path to ground, which I think why a lot of people like that. You know the button antennas have a, a coil at the bottom, which is I think is an impedance matching thing? Right. Are you familiar with them? I just wondered if that's... A derivation of that. Yeah, I think they have some capacitance in there as well, though, don't they? They're a bit more complicated than this because they're trying to match multiple bands mm. at the same time. Um, we'll talk about it in the bar. Yeah. Show me a circuit diagram. <laughs> um, so I think that's all I wanted to, to demo because it's probably enough, really, isn't it? <laughs> um, any more questions? Sorry, me again. Um, something I wanted to do recently, and, and actually um, David had the common mode choke with the FT24031 type uh, ferrite earlier on. I made one of those very recently for a, as a choke on a vertical antenna, and I've, I've got a nano VNA, and I was wondering how do I measure the, um, the impedance of this over a frequency range? I don't want you to go into it now. Of the antenna or, or no, of, of the, the choke. choke? Of the choke. Right. Um, maybe we can chat later about it. Yeah, okay. I could answer now, but if it's up quick. to you. Well, I mean, all, all I would say is, I mean, you've got to think about what a common mode choke does. So it's trying to stop current going down the outside of the braid. So that's the thing you need to measure. Um, rather than any impedance in the differential mode. So <laughs> let me just attempt to...
Um, so let's say you just have a fairly simple by filer choke. Um, <clears throat> I mean, you could do that with just your piece of coax if you wanted to. Is that what you've got? A piece of coax? Yeah. So, so one of these wire, one of the these represents the outer. One of these represents the inner. But what you want to do is measure. That. So you want to measure S21. And, and in fact, you only need to measure it on the, because you're using coax, just measure it on the braid outer so you can completely ignore one of those. So this, this would be your, your S21 measurement here. So you're connecting your, your nano VNA coax to here. And that's so that's the one port, and that's the I don't know which way around it is. I think it's uh, yeah, that's the two port. Yeah, and then you'll end up with an S two one result, which does you know something like that, and that's your suppression of the common mode. Yeah, and it's a DB result. Got another question. Back to basics again. A basic question. Um, how do you tell from the, the chart again which is series or which is parallel? Is it the direction of the? Yeah, you can you can tell from the direction. So I think um, let's go back to the Smith chart. <laughs> Doesn't come off very well. Does it? <laughs> um, Redraw our Smith chart. Um, so if if something is a, um, a series, well, we, as an example, we did our. Um, oh, I've got it up here. Yeah, R R C. So as Maybe you so maybe it's around here somewhere. Let's say, but it will follow this arc. So it will follow the li the line of constant resistance, if it's a series R and C, or even as oh, actually I've drawn it inductive. But whether it's um, got inductance or capacitance in the way, it'll move on the lines of constant resistance. So you've got other. Um, Sort of graticules that go around here, but they all sort of they all do this kind of thing. So, but you know, maybe maybe you're here somewhere. It's going to move in this direction if it's a series combination. But if it's not, if it's a parallel combination, and you change frequency, it's it's going to go in the opposite direction. So it's going to be going in that direction. Hands up again, all those who've got a VNA. Hands up, all those who are going to go home and try this. <laughs> Good. We call that a success. Yeah. <laughs> well, thanks, Andy. That was okay. absolutely fascinating. I've got to say, to see it working like that. And um, I think it, it, it works well on the end of the theoretical bit you did that I actually had another look at on YouTube oh, right. okay. earlier in the week. Thanks very much.